Thank you. Well, we know water is a critical issue. Do you know this little dot there, what that tiny little white dot is, our, our pale blue planet floating there, also known as Spaceship Earth? Uh, it's blue for a reason. You know, we look at the ocean and we just think of infinite resources. It's the vastness of the ocean, but really we become so aware that how finite our resources are, even though they look so large. The uh, oceans are incredible in, the, in that they take 97% of all of the Earth's water by volume and 71% of the planet's surface. But it's incredible how little water there is. There is 97% of the water on the planet is, is essentially salt water that leaves 3%. One and a half percent of that is frozen, inaccessible, and the rest is potentially fresh. So it actually leaves less than one percent of all the water on the planet is actually drinkable. It happens to be geographically in different places around, around the world. So it, it's an amazing substance. This came from outer space. I mean, this foreign material is the same amount that's always been here. It never changes. It changes its state from a liquid to a vapor uh, to a frozen substance. But it's just an incredible material that it's so precious. And obviously, water is life for everything on, on the planet. However, according to the United Nations, about 1.2 billion people, that's going to be about a fifth of the entire world's population, live in areas of severe water scarcity. And this is an incredible... Uh, concern for the future. This is a global problem. You can see the areas here in red and orange. It's not specific to, an, to one area. The water stress by country is also shown here. This is the ratio of water withdrawals to the supply. And you can see the United States there, extremely high water stress, about 80%. So this is a, based on a business scenario. What happens if we don't manage our resources, that if we just keep things going as they are, and we're not efficient in our use of, of technologies for harvesting or collecting water? There are also huge issues around the, the kind of hydropolitical interaction. We know when there are scarcity issues, whether it's food or water, that could lead to civil unrest, to mass migrations, things that happen like in Syria and other places. So these are areas cross-hatched, which uh, encompass most of the planet where these, these kind of stresses could happen. Of course, California we know well, you know, and especially Los Angeles, because we are really in a state of perpetual drought. We've had a long sustained drought. This map changes radically, but we have significant drought stress because we take our water from long distances. About 17% of our entire energy budget in California comes from the distribution and pumping of water. That's a, a huge disproportionate waste of energy. It's very hard to move water around. It's very heavy and requires energy. And people often don't think about that energy water nexus. And that's, that's a very important issue. Of course, this is California. This is what our drought looked like and what 63 trillion gallons of water looked like as it disappeared. Mount Whitney actually grew taller because of the settling of our, of our valley with our usurping of the underground aquifers. So one of the things that I've personally been interested in as an architect is for 35 years I've been working on sustainability and buildings, but moving more towards a regenerative and restorative building. That is, that buildings we know can make electricity, they can take light, they can convert it to electrons, they can grow food, they can do many things where they actually can give back more than they take, since buildings are the number one global greenhouse emitter. That's a very, very important issue. But we need to do more than just kind of 
minimize the bad, be less bad, we actually need to repair and restore. And we can do that in many of these ways, but we can't really do it well with water in Los Angeles. We can collect it, and we should, but we get a lot of water in a short period of time. And so we need to start looking at this from a standpoint of abundance. And when we look at water vapor, there's 37.5 million billion, and that's 16 zeros. It's a lot of water vapor at any one time. If it were to condense, that can cover the entire planet one inch of water. So this is the idea of abundance rather than scarcity, which we looked at. How does mankind look at technology? How do we harness technology to do better with what we have? We've been wasteful. You know, we've certainly used the technologies that we've had. Sometimes they're antiquated, and they have negative feedback. If we take, you know, say, oil, fossil fuels, we extract it, then we put that into CO2 emissions, then we start to have a cumulative series of negative feedback loops because everything is, a, is part of a system. So what's interesting is that in the environment, in our troposphere, there's more fresh water in any given time than all the rivers on, on the planet combined. It's, uh, it's quite, quite staggering. So here's uh, a chart just looking at the atmosphere versus all the rivers. It's, it is something that I don't think we often look at, but the entire ocean, all of the combination of plants through evapotranspiration on a regular basis evaporate and create moisture. You see it in the form of clouds, but oftentimes, even when you don't see clouds, there's, there's vapor. This is 95% of this troposphere is, in fact, water vapor. And this is what it looks like. You can see it uh, with satellites. You can actually see how much water, especially along the equator and north and south of the equator. So when you look at our 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 skies and you see that you're literally seeing water condensing onto nuclei of particles and forming clouds and we know that when clouds form and they the heavier they get then they turn into uh, to water so if you think about a glass of ice in a warm room you get condensation that is the difference between the warm temperature and the cold temperature creating that. You also can get evaporation. That's basically just changing the process of, of water vapor to, due to heating up, or you get condensation, which is the opposite due to cooling. So how, what we've been interested in is how do we use these natural processes to create a biomimetic, that we're mimicking nature, to take warm air, hit a cold surface, and condense it, and mimic clouds, essentially clouds in a box. And this is one of the machines I installed up in Big Sur, for instance, where there's uh, a real difficulty with, with groundwater. And how can we do this in a hyper-local, contextual way to, for point-of-use water solutions? Um, and what if we put many of these things on buildings, then we actually have water farms. So instead of taking water from long distances or building huge dams or pumping, what if we don't have a central infrastructure, which is also vulnerable, right? We look at Flint when it comes to water quality. Um, we look at Puerto Rico, for instance, recently, as we have more and more extreme weather conditions. Single point systems are prone to failure, where we can have redundancy. And not only that, we can have resiliency against the climate. So some of the things that we've been looking at are ways that we can make interventions within our landscape, in this case, billboards. How do we turn them into cloud forest? How do we turn them into greenhouses to harvest air, to filter air, to bring those down, to have a, a kind of a relief in the urban landscape, and to use solar energy and harvest water down the column and activate the ground with a sky well, essentially, in the way that people come to, to a drinking fountain. So we're doing some projects where we're looking at billboards 
Uh, we've been looking at greenhouses. And ultimately, we've been looking at how we can incorporate this into a kind of mobile solution that's rapidly deployable that can be moved anywhere. And we're using the byproducts of biomass gasification, things like wood chips, that instead of have, having the CO2 get into the atmosphere, we're actually sequestering that CO2, putting it in the form of a byproduct called biochar. And that biochar goes into the soil and becomes a, a nutrient. It, it absorbs water, it likes bac beneficial bacteria, and it actually tricks the root zone into thinking that it went through a fire and promotes plant growth due to the carbon loading. So this is kind of that, that intersection of, 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 of having a byproduct in a positive way. We've been developing these local carbon networks where we're providing the biochar into the soil. And this is a carbon negative technology. We're taking CO2 from the air, putting it into the ground where it can stay for hundreds of years and have a beneficial property. So it's a systems approach really to water self-reliance, uh, resilience, and relief. We start with biomass, chip it up, capture the humidity that's in, the, in that biomass, which is about 50 or 60 percent air and water, and then we use the heat by process through that. So resilience, reliance, and response, emergency response. So we came up with this concept that won the um, Water Abundance X Prize, where we're using the basic elements of earth, fire, air to make water, putting them in an intermodal shipping container. You essentially have clouds in a box. You create electricity. You create water, you, and refrigeration is a byproduct. And these are things that are now no longer dependent upon infrastructure, but can be mobile and be in a state of readiness. And so that's, that's what we've, we've been doing. Um, we literally just won the Water Abundance X Prize. There were 98 teams from 27 countries over two years. And now we're looking at the next opportunities of how we can actually productize this and make this uh, into a reality. So thank you very much.